Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, I will actually prove the Schur's lemma and then we will also see some consequences of Schur's lemma. So, which will be used later in the theory of semi-simple algebras. So, this is again like uh, in any category of representations uh, one can define Schur's lemma. Okay. So, here if you have seen this in group theory or uh, representation theory of groups, okay, it is almost similar to that. Okay. So, we start with uh, again uh, Lie algebra and uh, let us take uh, two different representations. Okay. Let us say V and W. So, both of them are uh, representations of G. So, we will take it to be irreducible, irreducible representations of G. So, then uh, if we have a map, let us say G module map uh, phi from V to W, we want to understand what are all the possibilities uh, for this map. Okay. So, say this phi is a map from V to W, uh, which is actually a G module map or homomorphism. So, what we have seen in the last class, uh, if we take the kernel of this map okay, and image of this map. So, both of them are modules in the respective uh, modules. Okay. This is a module inside V and this is module inside W. So, both of them are G sub modules. So, suppose uh, if we know that V is not isomorphic to W. So, then what will happen? So, you can see that this kernel phi. Okay, so, that uh, that should not be 0. So, what are all the options for kernel phi? Okay, let us let us not worry about this case. Okay, let us see like kernel phi being a sub module of V. So, what are all the options for kernel phi? So, the kernel phi either has to be 0 or full as V is irreducible. Okay. So, now if you take this image phi which is a module inside W. So, that will imply this image phi either again 0 or full again as W being irreducible. Okay. So, now you can see that if V is not isomorphic to W, uh, then what will happen? So, the image of phi is actually cannot be W. If image of phi is actually W, then what will happen? the kernel is actually has to be 0. Otherwise, okay, so if image phi is W, so then kernel cannot be actually entire V. If kernel is entire V, then that would imply that image phi is 0. So, that will imply that W is 0. So, maybe we can start with uh, V and W non trivial. Okay. So, non trivial means non zero irreducible representation. So, assume dimension V and dimension W they are all positive. I guess that was the de inbuilt definition of irreducible representation. To begin with, irreducible representation should be non zero space. So, that means dimension of V and dimension W must be at least 1. So, with that we can see that uh, if image of phi is W, then the kernel phi cannot be entire V that will force kernel phi is 0. So, that means this phi must be an isomorphism. But that is not the case. We have started with uh, V, V is not being isomorphic to W. 
okay. So, that is actually says that image phi cannot be w okay. So, this argument immediately says image phi cannot be w. So, that forces image phi is being 0. So, that forces kernel is being entire entire space phi okay. So, that means phi must be trivial map. that means phi of v is 0 for all v in v. So, what will happen if uh, v is isomorphic to w okay. We just saw that in that case uh, we can have such maps for example, if v is isomorphic to w. So, you can take w to be v itself not a problem. So, then for example, identity is one such uh, G model map and any scalar times identity that is also isomorphism from V to V. Okay. So, now the question is, is there anything else? So, if you think about it, there are no, there are none other than that. Okay. So, again from the same argument, uh, we can see that uh, kernel phi again either 0 or v and image phi is either 0 or w. If uh, <coughs> image is full, okay, so if image of phi is full, so then kernel of phi, so that cannot be 0, so that is also sorry that cannot be full. So, that has to be 0. So, that makes yeah this is actually isomorphism. So, we can uh, replace okay. So, we can look at this modified question now. So, where phi is from v to v okay. So, I am replacing w by v because we know that uh, v and w are isomorphic. So, so, consider this situation when uh, phi is defined from v to v. So, then what happens uh, since we are working over complex numbers, so phi must have I, an eigen value. Eigen value. Okay, of course, I am not mentioning we are all working over finite dimensional irreducible representations. Okay. So, everything is finite dimensional that was declared in the beginning. So, that is why I am not mentioning it here. So, since V is finite dimensional, this map phi which is a linear operator on V must have eigen value. So, say lambda. Okay. So, then you can look at this phi minus lambda identity. So, which is a map from V to V. So, phi is G module map implies phi minus lambda identity v is also a G module map. So, that is not hard to verify, but if you look at the kernel of this phi minus lambda i v. So, that must be non-zero because lambda being Eigen value there exists a Eigen vector associated with that. So, there exists v in v such that phi of v equal to lambda v. Okay. So, that means this non-zero vector v is inside this kernel of phi minus lambda v identity v. But the kernel is being non-zero would imply <coughs> that the kernel of this phi minus lambda identity v which is being a sub module of v it has to be exactly equal to v. So, that forces that phi minus lambda identity v is 0 on capital V. So, that forces that phi must be lambda times identity v. Okay. So, these two actually kind of analysis put together is called Schur's lemma. So, sometimes the statement 2 is also called Schur's lemma, but I would like to call both of them as Schur's lemma. So, what is Schur's lemma? So, let me state it, shoes 
lemma the very first statement if v is not isomorphic to w so again v n everything is as before g is lie algebra and v n w <coughs> are finite dimensional irreducible g modules so these are all given data if v is not isomorphic to w then any map phi from v to w must be trivial map okay so that is what we proved okay <coughs> Yeah, if V is not isomorphic to W, uh, then the image phi cannot be W, and uh, so that means image phi must be zero. So that means phi is trivial map. The second statement: if phi is from V to V, G module isomorphism, then phi has to be lambda times identity for some lambda coming from complex numbers okay so these two are uh, two important statements about uh, irreducible representation and the maps between them <coughs> so if you write it in terms of uh, home so we can actually denote this home space of g v comma w so that is uh, it is a subspace of home v comma w uh, which is defined to be the set of all g module maps from v to w so it is not hard to see this is actually a subspace so this is a subspace of home v comma w so which is all linear maps from v to w okay so in in terms of this uh, home g v w schur's lemma can be read as follows so home v comma w is trivial if v is not isomorphic to w or otherwise is just scalar times identity if v equal to w <coughs> okay so now what is the corollary of this uh, result immediate corollary so you take again g to be lie algebra over c and let <coughs> v be a will be an irreducible module okay g module so if there is an element in the center of g so which is uh, those x in g such that x commutes with y for all y in g so then this z must act as a scalar on capital okay so what is the meaning of that there exists lambda in c such that z dot v is given by lambda v for all v in v okay so this is actually an immediate uh, consequence of uh, what we have seen earlier because uh, what is the proof the proof is suppose z is in the center so then <coughs> what happens if you look at this action of z on this capital v so then you can easily see that uh, this z actually commutes with the action of x okay so if you compute z acting on xv for some x in g so then this will be exactly equal to x dot z dot v plus the bracket z x dot v 
okay so for any x in g and v in v we have e z x dot v is given by x dot e z dot v plus e z x okay so that means e z dot x dot v is given by x dot e z dot v uh, <coughs> so this e z x is 0 so that would imply e z x dot v is also 0 so that proves e z of x v is nothing but x of e z v so that proves e z defines g module map on capital okay but v is given to be irreducible representation so from the shure's lemma we can see that z on v is nothing but given by lambda times identity on v so this is actually allows us to define what is called this uh, central characters okay so if you start with the lie algebra and v is irreducible g representation so then one can define what is called the sky from the center of g2 complex numbers <coughs> given by chi of z equal to lambda z where think this lambda z coming from this map z so where z acting on v is given by lambda z iv okay so where you think so z acts on capital v as scalar multiple lambda v times lambda z times identity okay so now it is not hard to see that uh, this is actually uh, gives a linear map okay so that is i will leave it to you to check so z of g is actually abelian lie algebra so z of g is abelian lie algebra okay so this map chi one can easily check that it is a linear map so let me let me check so if you take chi of z1 plus z2 so this is given by lambda z1 plus z2 so if you think about it z1 acts or z1 v is given by lambda z1 times v similarly z2 v is given by lambda z2 v so if you take z1 plus z2 and then acting on v so you get lambda z1 plus lambda z2 acting on v so this is for true any v in v so that would imply that lambda z1 plus z2 must be equal to lambda z1 plus lambda z2 similarly if you take a scalar so then you get scalar here okay and then that will also tell you that uh, you get scalar outside c times lambda z2 times c okay so lambda c z2 will be equal to lambda times c times lambda z2 so this forces that uh, this is linear okay so this implies chi of z1 plus c times z2 is same as chi of z1 plus c times chi of z2 so that implies chi is linear but since z of g is actually abelian lie algebra so one can think this chi as representation of z of g so chi is indeed okay so since chi uh, is linear map from center of g to complex numbers one can think chi as z of g representation 
So, this is what called central characters. Okay. So, we have started with, so let me actually use V everywhere. Okay. This is chi V because chi V is depending upon uh, this capital V. Okay. So, what we have done, we have actually started with some G module and then we have come up with the representation of central G. So, you start with finite dimensional irreducible G representations. So, from here you are actually defining one dimensional one dimensional representation of center of G. So, the way we do it you start with V and then you map it to chi v. So, sometimes it is important to actually understand. So, what happens to this uh, central character? So, these are all called central characters and uh, we actually have a very vast theory about central characters of uh, semi simple algebras. So, which we will actually see later. Okay. So, now I would like to end with uh, one uh, important uh, remark about Heisenberg-Lie algebra okay. and then uh, we will actually later move on to the representation theory of SL2C in the next lecture. So, there are like many interesting questions one can ask once we have introduced this uh, representation theory. Okay. So, let me actually do one small problem here. So, that actually tells you that how interesting is the representation theory. So, recall the Heisenberg algebra, so which is spanned by x, y, z, okay, where x, y the bracket is given to be z and z is in the center of this h3. Okay. So, now one can easily show that so, this is indeed soluble Lie algebra, okay. the H3 is soluble. So, now using uh, Lie's theorem, uh, you can prove that any one dimensional representation of sorry, any irreducible representation of H3 must be one dimensional. So, let us say phi is actually uh, representation of H3, okay. so V is irreducible H3 representation let us say. So, now using Lie's theorem, what we have there exists vector non-zero vector inside capital V such that, so this is going to be simultaneous eigen vector. So, that means given x dot v will be lambda of x v for all sorry x dash let us put x dash inside h 3. So, that means this space generated by C v inside this capital V this will become sub representation of v, but since v is irreducible that will imply that C v equal to capital. Okay. So, this H 3 <coughs> because it is soluble, so all the irreducible representation of H 3 must be one dimensional and this is true for any finite dimensional soluble Lie algebra. So, that is immediate consequence of uh, Lie's theorem. So, now what we will prove, we will prove that so, this H3 does not have a faithful finite dimensional irreducible representation. Okay. So, let us say phi is a faithful representation of H3. So, that means phi is faithful. Actually, let us see what happens if we start with any representation. Okay. So, if phi is just a representation of uh, this H 3. So, then what happens? 
you can look at this commutator formula. So, this x y is given to be z and z is inside the center of h 3. Okay, so, that is the commutating formula. So, now what is happening? So, if you take this x and y, so look at the action of this action on capital V. Okay. So, V will be invariant under both these actions. So, in particularly if I compute the trace of this x y as an operator on capital V. So, this is going to be 0 because the bracket x y on capital V will act as follows. So, this will act as okay. So, let me let me write it properly the bracket x y acts on capital V as x dot y dot v minus y dot x dot v for all v in v okay, because the bracket x y dot v is equal to this. So, that means this is actually a commuted okay, inside, uh, inside that uh, g l of v. Okay. So, basically what I am trying to say if you take this phi of bracket x y it is going to be bracket of phi x phi y. So, that means if you take the trace of phi x phi y that is going to be 0, but on the other hand the trace of phi x phi y is nothing but phi of z trace. Okay. But what we have seen from Schur's lemma, this z is being in the center. So, this z is being in the center that implies phi of z must be some scalar times identity on V. So, that means this trace of phi z should be lambda times dimension of V and this put together implies lambda dimension V should be equal to 0. So, that will imply lambda must be 0. That means this phi of z is always 0. Okay. That means z acts trivially on any representation of h3. Okay. So, this kind of interesting consequences can be derived from just uh, by looking at the commutator of uh, the Lie algebra. Okay. So, this is what uh, we will do next time and then try to understand uh, the SL2 representation theory. Okay. So, just as a warm up I gave this as a consequence of this Schur's lemma. So, I will stop here uh, in the next class we will start with the SL2 representation theory. Thanks.